Um, so what's the story with the gigantic team? Because I read something about how they were fighting back, but then I guess they lost, which is unfortunate. What I read was that um, they actually ran out of money uh, a bit ago and basically kept working, just hoping someone would buy them. Someone did? Yeah, perfect world. And then just didn't uh, work out? I think the problem was that they weren't making enough money. Well, at least Perfect World was trying to help. Yeah, I um, yeah, I experienced this. I've seen this happen time and time again. This is why I always continue to keep working on my portfolio. Always. Wow, this is amazing. Ooh, this person's dope. Ukraine, eh? Aren't they going through some some ish right now? All right. You guys ever use um Pure F. So good. So Pure F is basically, you can just have ref, I, I forgot to install it. You can just have ref like floating. And it goes over all your apps. Oops. So I found this artist a while ago and I really liked the way that they paint. I thought to myself, I don't want to try to figure out how to paint like this. But for concepts. Seems like does it like a line drawing first course. Are those hotkeys for this? I didn't know that. I think this is fine for now. Maybe grab one more. And then you can just do this. And you can just have them floating. How the eh, whatever. All right, I see a question. Let me answer that question. AJ, the city accepted me. They are offering me a salary of twenty seven thousand euros a year, which is not much that much because they have a huge they have huge taxes, thirty five or something like that. The only thing that makes me think it's worth it is that they have a around 10,000 euro yearly. What do you think? I still have to go to the studio visit, but they seem like good people. Yeah, I mean, especially if you're just starting out, I don't think there's any problems like with getting paid a little bit lower than maybe what you've heard. And it all about location, right? Like, is that enough for you to, to survive? And for a lot of people, that is. For instance, forty thousand dollars in uh, forty thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars in in Southern California, like Orange County, where I live, it can probably get you barely anything, right? But if you live in like uh, or Orange County specifically, but if you live kind of where I, I grew up, which was Barcelona, California, then it's like cash money millionaires man so like for instance my friend was telling me like he's got like good amount of rent he's doing okay 
he's still in Barstow, and he said that like his house costs him six hundred dollars uh, a month for a two bedroom apartment, I believe, or one bedroom apartment. Or I think no, it was two bedroom. And I was like, that's cool. I have like a three bedroom apartment, and I'm paying three thousand dollars to stay here, and and food a month costs me up to. Two thousand to three thousand dollars every month for food for my whole family in in Irvine. So, like, just for basic living, where I am at, can cost upwards of seven thousand or six thousand to seven thousand dollars for just basic basic stuff. Do you understand? And so, if if it's like not nearly as much then there there's probably nothing they'll really worry about the kinds of questions that i would ask um i don't know it, I, I don't like what where are you coming from where is it you located costa rica yeah i don't know man i've never been my friends went one time they loved it but yeah, um, the benefits, these types of things I would ask for. Oh, you're from, you're going to Slovenia? Yeah, again, benefits, if there is any, what is the, because it, I know in some other countries too, for instance, like uh, certain social programs allow you to have things taken care of already, like healthcare. See, in the States, we don't have that. So for instance, um, I have to pay upwards of fifteen hundred dollars uh, a month just for my insurance for my whole family. So, and that that was not included in the, my basic expenses. I said just basic stuff costs me <laughs> upwards of six thousand dollars to seven thousand dollars. Now, including like all my other stuff, like my phone and or health insurance and my car expenses and all this other stuff that aren't necessarily needed as much, it gets yeah way above like ten grand, you know, and so so that's why we're really considering moving because a lot of that would be literally chopped in half. Could you imagine that? That's would be insanity. I would be so much more wealthy, and I can like work less, hang out with the family more. I already work pretty pretty sparingly, but you get my point. So I would, I would ask him like the cost of living, you know, like how much is it to live out there, these types of things. So you can like expect how much that value is worth. Because you might think 30,000 euros is not a lot, but when you get there, you'll live like a king. <laughs> you know what I mean? So for instance, like if I was making thirty thousand dollars in um Barstow, where I'm from again, then I'll live like a really nice life. I'll live the same kind of life I'm living now, just with added add the the bonus of having a really crappy neighborhood. Like Barstow is really bad. It's a really terrible um community. I um I know two people who've been shot and murdered. And so, uh, yeah, I'm not going back anytime soon. My friend who has a lot of his family out there, he he's like finally come to, to senses of like, there's nothing there for me. They're just, they're just so depressing. So he's beyond that too. Yeah, he might. I don't know if John will do that. But yeah, John is the person we're referring to. Um, it's not any cheaper out there. It's nice. It's real nice. But um, 
Yeah, me and my wife, we're not sure where we're going to go. We're thinking about somewhere in the States still because um, really what we, I need is internet. So as long as I have good internet, then I can really go anywhere. Um, but if they don't have internet, then I can't go there. So I can't go anywhere, really. <laughs> I can only go places that have really good internet. And within that limit, doesn't matter. And so we're just looking at all our options. So yeah, I would ask him about like just the cost of living, like how it is to survive out there and these types of things, like how much does it cost for a place and uh, if they're going to help. Because if you're relocating then, right? So you need to like have all this stuff squared away. And if they're not going to help, um, meaning like they're not going to do the groundwork for you, then you can just ask them how to get started on that. But most most studios would help because it's kind of kind of like hard if you don't know the land well enough, you don't know the communities and stuff. You might get stuck in like a really critic community. Any other questions? Are extra hours as normal as every artist makes them sound in a studio? Yeah, like having crunch? Yes, it's pretty normal. Because people don't budget time correctly. And I'm not saying this as someone who is good at that. Um, I too run into these problems, but when you have like a company where you have multiple people potentially falling behind because of one person's miscalculation, it's a whole different problem to overcome. So yes, we prepared for that. Yeah, it's not so much that they don't pay. I mean, most decent studios do, yes. It's a matter of uh, if they pay you extra. Because it's overtime, right? And depending on the country and the state and the province or whatever, um, there's different laws. So, for instance, in California, it's illegal to not pay people for overtime. You have to pay overtime. And it's also illegal um, to have people work a, a large amount of hours consistently without them taking a break. So like for instance, if you work like seven hours without taking a break, um, you can sue the company. Just most people just don't because they want to keep their jobs. But in, in the circumstances uh, I've seen and witnessed, yeah, I highly recommend that you, um, you try to like make sure you get paid at least, you know, make sure that you get some sort of payment for all the work you do. Know what I mean? Any other questions, friends? Yeah, I have. Oh, no. Tarek, I knew it. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, regarding my my work so far, uh, how far you, would you say it's uh, it's been like acceptable professional quality to to get through studio, something like that? 
Uh, it all depends on which studio. <laughs> and that's uh, the second part of my question. Uh, Adam, which studio uh, would you know that uh, are looking for, for this kind of, of, uh, of style or, or of, yeah, this kind of style? Uh, I don't know, off the top of my head. <coughs> so I made a comment about you can't control any of this, right? Yeah. And the reason why I say that is because sometimes some game studios um, that might like the style that you're going for are just not hiring anymore or yeah. hiring at all. Um, and so the, the point of that is to understand that there's nothing that can be done about that other than you just keep making work. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what's really important about understanding this, this problem is that you know the second part of the problem that I say is the solution, which is contacting these people and, and going out of your way of going to these events and making friends face to face. Mm -hmm. Because once you've done that, then you might find the companies who um, you didn't even know existed. Just as much as it is hard for you to be found amongst yeah. the sea of amazing artists, <laughs> it's hard for um, a studio to be noticed amongst the, the sea of amazing other studios. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's why it's also important for you to also go out there and, and make contacts and create these connections not just yeah. always waiting for them to reach out and send you the email. No, of course, uh, that's a right. more, yeah, I'm trying and to. So, so yeah. I'd say don't worry about um, that specifically. I would say focus in on something a little more reliable, which is, which would be uh, focusing on, well, who do you, who do you want to work for? Huh, right? That's a good question. Yeah. And then and then go from there instead of who would hire me, because um, it is hard to kind of discern. But I think that's an easier answer to or question to answer. Like for me, I've always kind of wanted to work at Blizzard Cinematics, so I always made my artwork fit in that the uh -huh. demo, you know. Yeah. And then when I finally worked there, I was like, oh, yeah, nice, All right? Yeah. But it wasn't my it wasn't my intention to work there. Um, I didn't, uh, at one point, I didn't think I was going to. Like, it wasn't okay. like I was, uh, I didn't have it in my mind thinking that I'm going to work at Blizzard and then my life will be complete. <laughs> I was thinking, like, I want to work at Blizzard. That'd be awesome. I want to keep trying and hopefully I'll get there, but one day. Um, but in the meanwhile, I'll just try to get really good at painting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I see. And so when you start to, to think in this way, you create a better scenario for yourself. Because um, a lot of times what ends up happening is people expect that they're going to get a job at this company after they put X amount of work in, like it's a video game. And that's the, the, the thing that I want you guys to run into. Okay. Right, like it's not a video game. There's, very, there's a high chance that maybe you'll never work for the studio that you want to work for. But that doesn't mean that you won't have a lucrative career working for all these really amazing companies doing amazing stuff. Yeah, I see. You know? Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, because uh, actually I'm not looking for, for any particular studio. I just uh, want to, uh, you know, make the career change and... Uh, know why uh, you're uh, waking up in the morning to get to work not uh, to do your like shitty job at the grocery store or just uh, doing uh, illustration and concept art is uh, is good uh, so uh, i'm yeah ready to move uh, anywhere uh, i must to 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 get to it so uh, not very uh, into one specific studio or uh, sell of course uh, some are more appealing for me than uh, others like uh, some video games uh, i do uh, like them more than others so uh, but they're not always the best uh, job uh, either it's not because the one of their video game is good that is good for to work for them so i don't know <laughs> yeah uh, can i can i add something to that 
Yeah. So um, in terms of like getting noticed, uh, and how would you say like, what, what would be like the best way for like a film, like to get noticed in like the film industry? Because I know it's like very different from like a video game because film, it's like, you mentioned it at the beginning, how it's like super closed off and you had to like uh-huh. know people. Like, uh-huh. how would you even like, where, where would you even start? Like, do you have to like go out in Hollywood and just like start meeting people <laughs> or something? Yeah. Literally. <laughs> I um, mean, you, you got to be good and they got to like reach out to you, right? Like having work that's good is one of the best strategies in most scenarios. Mm-hmm. But working for Hollywood, you just got to get good and you just got to go to these events and you just got to meet these people, man. Let me tell you a story. Like once my friend, uh, he didn't want to go to Comic-Con. He got like, um, he got a pass to go, but he just felt like he, he didn't feel good enough and he wanted to keep working on his portfolio. But like he was just really kind of, um, he just didn't feel into it. And then someone told him like, well, you should just go, man. Like just go. Uh, I hear ILM is like recruiting people. Like it won't hurt just to go show your stuff to them, you know? Mm-hmm. And then he was just like, oh, I guess you're right. So he went, showed his stuff to them. The guy saw it. And then he was just like, yeah, you're good. Do you want a good job? And he hired him. <laughs> and, and so then he worked in film for a, uh, several months at uh, ILM. But he, he, he always talks about that story, and I like to tell the story, too, because we always talk about, like, yeah, you got to go places. Because he, he, if he didn't go, then he wouldn't have had that chance, right? Hmm. And don't get me wrong, like, his work is good, too. It helped that he had good work. Like, he didn't feel that way, but it was good enough for them, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what uh, a lot of people don't pay attention to. They focus a lot of times on just... I just got to keep my head down, not talk to anybody and just get really good. But sometimes that getting really good part is hard to determine on your own. Hmm. So it's really easy to determine when you constantly go out and talk to these people and they'll tell you why you're not good, like to your face. And they'll tell you exactly the things you need to improve upon. And, and these will be the types of people that you do want them to critique your work. You want them to give you that feedback. Um, and then, and then the best case scenario is maybe you've, you've reached that pinnacle or you are good now, you know, yeah. but you didn't really realize it. And then they're like, yeah, this stuff's good. Like we're higher. And you're like, what? Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, the film industry, like to be like a contractor to get hired consistently, that is very challenging. And a lot of that is because, um, they have the union and, and unions, in some instances are great but the more the more you really look into it like a lot of unions uh, prevent innovation and prevent new talent from coming in specifically speaking for like the film industry but like um i had a friend who was just like he was telling me like if i ever want to get in because he got in and he's like if you want to get in man like let me know i'll get you in here too you know yeah but it's not like, okay, great. Let me get in there. Like you have to go through applications. You have to um, pay like a lot of money. Like I think it was like $6,000 or something just to get like it, like going through the process. So they like, they put a lot of hurdles, you know, to keep, to keep people out. And cause unions are supposed to protect from the, the large corporations. But when, when people, get corrupt like they they can become the corporations in which they were trying to protect themselves from you know yeah and this is one of those examples and uh, i had a friend who works in the in the thing and it, yeah it was, it was like a nightmare for him he said it was just took forever and now that he's in he's worked on these films but i don't think he's happy about it like he made a lot of money sure because you can make a lot of money working in the film industry you know but I mean, my my point to you, both of you, is don't focus on getting jobs. Focus on getting good and making friends. Just trust me on that, right? 
And, yeah. and it doesn't mean that when an application comes by or like an opportunity, you're like, AJ said, don't get a good <laughs> job. What I'm saying is like, if you're focused all your time on like, what do I need to do to have in my portfolio? Um, like, am I like, do, have I crossed all my T's, dotted all my, uh, dotted all my I's? Like that kind of perspective, like I would say you need to just not focus so much like that. You need to focus more on, well, am I even just good enough? <laughs> you know, don't don't focus on the lowest common denominator. Focus on just the the minimum requirements, which is basically being epic. <laughs> you know? And then and then focus in on then you can focus in on the more of the subtle things like like once you're good, right? Like then you can start focusing in on okay, well, I need to have this, right? For them to take me seriously, I need to have this. But at that time, you'll probably be already working. You know, you'll probably have more opportunities. And keep building your portfolio. You know. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's tough business, the film industry specifically, <laughs> and it's not necessarily as glorious as people make it out to be. Um, you might think that you see all these people post online, like oh, I worked on uh, on this movie, and look at all the things I did, and you're like, they don't. I want to work in movies because movies is attached to like celebrities and like things that we've loved growing up you know there's a lot of nostalgia yeah a lot of misguided appreciation yeah. um it, like films are, are great but doesn't necessarily mean working in films is great uh, i personally like hated it right like i think i talked to you guys about this i'm not sure but i'll tell you again like i um uh, and I don't mean like I hate every single person I've ever worked with or I like think that they're all clowns and I, I don't think anybody should work in the industry. No, that's obviously not true. I have a lot of good friends who are concept artists that work there in the industry. Um, and it's not even s specifically focused on the concept artist. It's just kind of the environment. So like in high school movies, right, there's like the, the cool kids and then there's like the nerds right uh, yeah yeah and so to me um film always felt that way right it felt like the cool kids right oh was, okay <laughs> you see what i'm saying like and yeah. i don't i don't necessarily associate myself with those those types of attitudes and uh environment like yeah. i can get along with those those that kind of environment and that type of um culture right i've done it in when i was in high school mm -hmm. right i used to play sports and i, I understand you know yeah. Um, but, uh, I, I feel the most comfortable with like folks like you, like nerds, because <laughs> <laughs> we are right. We're, we like, like movie superhero movies or yeah. comic books and mangas and uh, anime. Yeah. And, uh, we're really into like toy collection. I, I don't have any toys, but you know, most of us would be really into that. Yeah. Um, what else is really nerdy? <laughs> like we we you know like we 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 really into that culture you know yeah and the game industry like yeah we play video games too you know like a lot of these film guys would like have never played a video game probably why these video game movies are so terrible you know yeah, yeah. and so like you know that and and it's and like i said it's not necessarily i'm trying not to be too critical because i do hold these people very uh high i, I have high uh value for a lot of these people that i'm criticizing and and just to give you perspective like my my wife is uh like really into that kind of stuff too she's not really a nerd either and that's why i think it's great because she she's really just a good person but she she doesn't know about video games and all that kind of stuff right yeah and so um <clears throat> there's a nice opportunity for us to have contrast in our conversations and so what i'm trying to get at though is it like if I'm gonna like other than people like my wife, it's very unlikely that I'm gonna just be cool all the time hanging out with this specific group. And and what I'm trying to get across is that uh, this happens like a lot of my friends who who end up going in the film that they almost have the same sentiment, you know. And it's not bad, man. If you're into it, like I said, there's some people that are just they're made for that, right? And they just like love it. Uh, I'm not. And so be cautious. It's not, it's not always what you expect. It's the whole grass is greener argument. 
Okay? Oh, yeah. And the, the same thing could be true about the game industry. I had friends who uh, left film to work in games and they hated it, you know? Mm. And I would imagine for the same reasons, but all flipped. Yeah. Okay. And so then, and I have people who have worked in games continu continuously and then they, they prefer freelance over studio. Like they got a job in the in freelance, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they love it. And then they, they got studio work. They hated it. You know? And so, and I have friends who work studio and then they switch to freelance and then they hate freelance. And now they're <laughs> looking to get studio jobs. I actually have a friend that I just talked to the other day. He was just saying to me, he's like, I hate freelance. And so. Um, I mean, do you think part of that is uh, you kind of have to like, you know, get used to it a little bit? That, yeah, I, I agree with that. But just some people just feel differently. For instance, uh, I prefer working in the studio, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't anymore. Because what I also prefer is being close to my family. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that trumps my love for studio. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Like if I didn't have a family, I would, I would opt out for studio life. But since I have a family and I was always away and I would work long hours, I didn't like that. Huh. you know yeah like if i'm gonna work long hours i'd rather like i want to be at least around so that my kids can see that i'm human and i'm doing stuff and i'm their dad you know yeah, of course. and so um and that's just important to me that's kind of what i'm trying to make a point of mm -hmm. all right that's not necessarily the right avenue i'm just telling you exactly the contrast okay and so when you guys are looking to get these jobs, this is something you should consider. Yeah. And that's why I always say focus less on the job, right? Yeah. Focus and more on the more work because the, the jobs will come to you based off of your work, especially now more than ever, because there's more and more avenues for people to see your work, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to, to think that uh, when you see the top, artists like uh, an artist station no it's it's always really hard to, to see how somebody would hire you instead of all these guys so that's uh, well yeah. most of those people are already working yeah and yeah. that's like true for the the remainder of history that's always been true that's not a very good variable to focus on mm -hmm. like oh look at all the competition that's always been around there's always yeah. competition. The last generation said the same thing when people started um, posting their work in like, you know, um, the newspaper maybe, right? And, oh, now everybody has this thing, you know? In every industry, there's always like a lot of new competition that never changes. Um, you're, you're just assuming, you're assuming a few things, which is false, which is, you're assuming that there's only there's still only two companies that are willing to hire, <laughs> right? Yeah, like there's of. only there's only like one or like one or two really big studios, right? Yeah. But no, there's there's hundreds of them, and there's more to come, you know. Like Minecraft wasn't a thing like several years ago, and now it's like one of the biggest games out there. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like that that yeah. the next Minecraft or the next Destiny or the next things around the corner. You know, so for instance, like Gigantic, the, the company that made that game, you know, they, they, they crashed and burned, right? It's unfortunate, but they were on to making something really amazing, you know? And so imagine if the game was a success and imagine if people did enjoy it. Imagine if it got the recognition that people feel like it deserved, whatever, right? Then that's one extra studio now looking to hire a whole body of, of artists. Um, a better example would be like something like what's happening with Arc. Like Arc is now like huge, you know. Um, Steam is now releasing like, like a few thousand games a year now, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so all these people need artists. That's what I'm saying. Like, just like there might be more competition for artists, there's more uh, studios that need to hire, right? So the one thing that stays the same, remember, you can't focus on anything else other than what? What are the two things? Like, your work. Quality. Yeah. Quality of your work. And yeah, absolutely.
because <laughs> all these things will definitely change. You know, there might be more demand for stylized one day, and then one day there might not be. You know, hmm. um, but if you're one of the best stylized artists out there, and you know a lot of people in that industry, uh, you're going to get picked up. You know, oh, you, you just have yeah. higher in chances. But if you didn't talk to anybody and you stayed in your shell and then your company collapses, like what happened with the gigantic book, and you didn't upgrade your portfolio, you didn't do anything, you just sat there, and then the company co collapses, now all you got is work, but nobody knows you other than your other coworkers. Huh. Uh, right? And that's not a good situation to be in. And I can tell you that from experience. Okay? And so, um, and I've seen it time and time again. Like I told you guys, like when one of my students reached out to me with the same conundrum and I was like, it's not like I didn't warn you, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm telling you guys too, you guys one day will experience this, but then hopefully you will be wise enough to know AJ said to keep my portfolio up and running always. So oh, that, that reminds me of, uh, I watched like a video. I, I forgot his name, but, um, he, he worked for the Valerian movie, but, um, he, he gave a talk about how you should always uh, keep your uh, portfolio up to date because sometimes you'll do work and they won't let you post it up online. So you can do work from like five years ago and you won't be able to put it up online. So yeah. then you have like the whole five years of, you did all this work, but you can't really show it to people. So you yeah. can't really like, yeah, you can't really go and get jobs for that or can't yeah. put yourself out. Yeah, it's absolutely true. So I think you're probably referring like, to Ben Morrow. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, do you recommend cold emailing companies sending art postcards on top of networking? Uh, you can do whatever, but the most effective is just in-person conversations, sometimes text messaging, like through Facebook, if they'll answer you, you know? You can just be appreciative. You don't have to be rude or like, hey, I want to network with you, Ming. Like, you can just be like, you know, I like your work. That's enough in a lot of cases. Um, and yeah, I mean, I made a lot of friends from just doing that. And it helps when you're good, I'm trying to tell you guys. Like, if you're a good artist, <laughs> they might already follow your work and then you reach out to them. They're just like, oh, what? Yeah, they have to hang out, you know? <laughs> Uh, it makes it easier if you they they look at your work, they take you more seriously. It's not to say that that's it's not to say that no one will ever respond to you because your work is bad. Uh, I'm just saying, I mean, think about it like from your own perspective, right? How much more seriously would you take even right now, as you guys are still young aspiring artists, from someone who's just another student? Yeah. Right. Hmm. Like talking to you and just being like, hey man, let's hang out and stuff. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, whatever, dude. You're like, get out of here. Even, yeah. even you, and you guys aren't even like pro yet, right? Like yeah. some yeah. of you aren't. And so, um, I try to avoid that problem. That's <laughs> probably why I have a lot of popularity and a lot of compassion uh, amongst my fans because I do reach out most of the time. <laughs> and so, um, that's what I'm trying to get at, though. You know, like I can control that. I can control whether I can talk to most of the people who respond to me or not. It's like if your mother is making you a compliment on your uh, drawing, you're like, yeah, thank you, mom. But <laughs> that's not the, the, the worth, uh, the, the most worthy uh, yeah. uh, opinion that I could get. <laughs> so with other students, I guess it's kind of the same. Yeah. And so, um, and that's a good point that I would say you should try to avoid too. Don't, if people respond to you, you should respond back. You should try yeah. to as much as you can. Yeah. Um, and uh, you only get better at it and you'll have better ways to respond to people of all sorts of uh, demographics. Yeah. But anyway. Networking. Yeah, making friends with people, dude. Just <laughs> saying. It's pretty valuable. Any other questions? Yeah, I think, uh, well, for me, that's uh, Thank you. Yeah, dude. Mm -hmm. When people talk about the politics, politics? <laughs> you mean <laughs> politics in a studio? What are they talking about? Polytikes. <laughs>
Um, uh, just politics, right? What's what? What is politics in general? Like, what is that? Like, do you know? Like, politics is just when people like look at what's going on in our own politics, right? Where people will put like the policies and their agendas ahead of like ethic behavior. <laughs> right. So, like, a company might. Uh, here's a good example. Like, um, you might have a disconcerting opinion than your coworker, and because of those politics, you might lose your job, right? Which is terrible, and I'm not a big fan of that. Um, like, I understand it. I uh, like I have like debates with people all the time, and I'm finding myself leaning more and more center the more I read about what's going on in the world. And, uh, but one of the things that I'm still kind of on the fence on is like, so there's this argument that companies can do whatever they want because it's their company. Like I own my own company. So if like, if, if I just wanted to um, start just, I don't know, just doing something really crude, you know, that's my prerogative, you know? And I actually agree with that sentiment, but then it comes with it comes to uh, to employee rights. That's where I start to feel a little bit more compassion. So, for instance, when people have a disconcerting opinion than mine, like if someone doesn't agree with my uh, my company policy, for instance, and they want to be critical of it, according to the law right now, for instance, I could fire them, especially if it's in the contract, you know. Uh, but you know, in a lot of right wing talking points are usually like, like, well, you know, ask the company's right. They can do whatever they want. And I'm thinking, yeah, but like, I feel like having an opinion and then firing somebody for that opinion seems kind of discriminatory, you know, especially if it's critical, not like, like malicious. Like there's a difference between if my employer comes in, my employee comes in and just says, AJ, you're a fucking dickhead. I hope you like suck some cocks and they're just like really <laughs> aggressive and like obviously slandering right and like malicious then yeah i don't think anybody would defend that person right mm -hmm. even if i did something let's say that was questionable you know um that's just not professional right i think most people agree with that that's just uh, aggressive and not constructive at all you know and maybe they like i said maybe it's because of something i did like let's say um they don't like how i only listen to the left side of the room and i mean like literally people that are sitting on the left side of my room okay just for whatever this is some random issue that this person has you know so they come and they think that they're being cheated out of their their voice they feel they're not being heard and the way that they approached me was by yelling and screaming that that's the scenario so in that situation i think most people would agree yeah let's you know that person being fired is kind of like that, that criticism may have started well intentioned, but their approach was not. Uh, another good example of this is uh, one of my friend's kids. They're, they're really, really bad. Like their kids are really bad. And we, we have a hard time hanging out with them because of how bad their kids are, or their kid. And we talked to them about it too. We were like, look, your kid's bad. Your kid's a bully. And uh, they don't like that, obviously. Nobody wants to get hear criticism of how their kid's being raised or whatever. But we've told them, um, you know, but listen, you know, we're trying to tell you because we love you. Because one day she's going to hear it from somebody else. You understand? And, uh, you know, if she doesn't hear from you, she's going to hear from someone else. And that's what happened. Some some person came up to her and was screaming at her uh, because they, she was picking on their uh, granddaughter. And this grandpa came up to her and just freaking unleashed. And she was traumatized from it because she's like, this old man just ran up to her and just started screaming at her, threatening, threatening her and stuff like that. Um, but like, think about the context of the, the situations. Like if I, if my kid was being bullied by a kid, I would probably not be very cool with it either, you know? Mm -hmm. And see, we were cool with it because we were her friends. We understand she's just a little girl. They're in power. So our crit criticism kept our friendship intact you know and we were obviously we're still friends we still are very close and they're aware that it's problematic right a little bit more more now so than it was before right 
and then uh but the, the way that the the grandpa handled it was obviously um like he was he again well intentioned but he went about it pretty aggressively and so i feel the same sentiment about like workplace politics like if someone says if someone says to me that like again going back to the the left room and right room that said to me you know you're a fucking dickhead hope you suck a bunch of dicks and whatever really crude very uh not constructive almost personal attack of their employer then yeah you expect to get fired it's just probably what's going to happen but then um if that same person came up to me and said listen you know i feel that you're only listening to one side of the room like whenever our opinion is being made you seems like you don't really cater to it uh, i documented it so out of nine meetings out of ten you went with the people on the left right what they had to say like the people on the left side of this room <laughs> okay and i feel like that's not fair i feel like you should give us a shake and if there is anything that we're not like if there's something that we're not saying or doing right maybe you should mix up the room so then it's we can get some people that maybe maybe the people on the left side are just smarter than us then maybe we should mix it up so that we can share our ideas with them and maybe they can help us pr improve them or you can tell us what we're doing wrong you know and i would say what how dare you how dare you have that opinion get out <laughs> you know and and i feel like i, I don't I, I don't agree with that and that's been happening more and more and you see this happening in the game industry now uh and you see this happening in uh, film industry and you have you see this happening in uh, the tech industry um and so it's it's starting to it's starting to surface like maybe we should have a conversation about this uh, so, for instance, there were people uh, for Gamersgate. You guys heard about that? Mm. You guys yeah. remember Gamergate? So, Gamergate was a, a thing <clears throat> where there was this uh, there was this female game developer, and I guess her game was doing poorly, and so she went out of her way to say that it was sexist. The reason why people didn't like her game was sexist, I, and I'm paraphrasing this. this. There's more nuance to this than I'm alluding to, but just to make a long story short. Um, she was wrong. It wasn't entirely accurate. She kind of lied about it, right? Uh, and apparently she was like sleeping around too, which I don't know if it's entirely true, but this is what was used against her. And so then you had a, a lot of these uh, feminists are coming out saying that the game industry is sexist and that this is the truth. And female developers and uh, artists or whoever are being undermined by like the patriarchy or whatever and so it's not that the narrative that was made by slash pole to shut down zoe quinn <laughs> that's the narrative that was made by pole what's pole can you elaborate zach for chan's racism board pole is politically incorrect and Basically, the, a lot of the gamer game movement started from uh, the poll board because they basically, like, the idea was that they used ethics as ethics in game journalism as a smokescreen to defend themselves from criticism that came, like, because Gamergate never managed to talk about ethics in game journalism. Like, that was their whole thing, and that's what they, you know, said they were about, but it was always just bashing on Zoe Quinn and female developers because they were invaders. Like it was never, it never so actually there's... got about ethics and game journalism. It was just, that was the backdrop they used to say, you can't remove our conversations. This is about ethics and game journalism. This is about, you know, journalistic integrity. Yeah. I don't know if that's accurate though, because here's, here's the point that I guess, what we were talking about the politics all right so you're asking if there's politics so this is a great example that this is true <laughs> because there's so many different narratives that are spun and i like like i said i'm actually not a person who knows a lot about it but in my experience um i just generally have never seen this much like it was crazy and i remember people flipping out and they were starting to say uh for instance that this person was doing all this stuff and i would I would highly encourage you guys to look into yourself, right? If you want to have an opinion about this. I don't really have one. I know I just know this that 
the game community themselves, the game industry themselves, I'm sure there's sexist people or people who are uh, misogynistic, but it's not nearly as bad as people were making it out to be. That's just a fact. Okay. And uh, for instance, we, we're starting to see the film industry starting to prove that they are actually probably more misogynistic than that they were alluding to. Right. And you have people like, uh, what's her name? Um, the one that's like really on the front end of this, something, Anna, something like she, she was pretty aggressive. She was even like criticizing all video games of being misogynistic. And I'm just like, I don't know about that either. You know, uh, a pretty good summary of the events of the Gamergate in the windows. Here, let's look at this. Do they cite any uh, reports of any kind? Because it's one thing if people are just commenting on it like I am. It's another thing if there's actual documentation. Yeah, I'm always a little skeptical of all <laughs> of all YouTube videos these days. Um, More or less, sorry. So, so and this is something very important for everyone here to understand. You should always be very skeptical on both sides, right? Because it is very important that if you want to have a very objective opinion about this, you have to look at all the, the facts and any data that's actually out. And so uh, someone can just like, here, here's, a, here's a great example, right? If you look at the left leaning, um, if you look at the left leaning uh, politics of, of our government right now, right? They, they spin this idea that, you know, okay, look, look at it like this. They, they spin it like the Hollywood and the media elites are liberal. They're for women's rights. They're for, you know, more fit women in the industry and all this stuff. At least that's what they say on the surface. But then when you follow the data, right, there's, very, there's a very slow amount of women developers in the film industry, right? Like low-level uh, film directors. And as you guys have probably seen, like countless, like one after another, just sexual assaults like sexual harassment misogyny like it's happening like almost every other day now people are just starting to say yeah yeah this is a thing you understand yeah. and it's kind of ironic isn't it it's like super ironic and um and so then you have a a, a tech company like google who's trying to diversify right i remember people flipping out about this they were trying to diversify their uh their company because they have like they had at 2014 they had 20 or 80 percent white dudes as their main demographic for their company which inherently there's nothing to me there's nothing inherently wrong with that if that's just how it ends up but then uh you know they didn't like that so they felt like okay we'll diversify our company oh i'm sorry let me i got that number wrong it was 70 percent to 30 percent in 2014 and i believe in 2015 2016 uh, they went up to 80%. So it increased their, they increased their white dude demographic when they were trying to diversify. <laughs> and and when, you, when you hear this, like I was trying to argue with some of my friends about this. I was like, like I understand that you're, you're, you think that Google's super inclusive. But I mean, this, the, static, the, the, the data doesn't support that. Like we have to like have an honest discussion about this, right? Are they truly inclusive as you might suspect? You know, and I'm not trying to say that they're not either. I'm just saying that there's just, you just got to look at the statistics, right? If you want to stay emotionally detached from any of this, you have to just look at the numbers. You have to look at the consistency of what's being said and what's actually happening. And so for instance, um, my whole time working in the industry, I've heard uh, a few cases where uh, women were sexually harassed in our industry, in the game industry. Right. But when, when I was working in the film industry, men are going back to the cool kids in high school versus the nerds. It was like almost every single person was in on it. It was crazy. I was like, what? Did like, that really happen? Like, how do people get away with this nonsense? You know? And sure enough, they're not, not anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when we were, when I worked at Sony, it wasn't like we were hiring people and like we were in the meeting and we'll say, Hey, there's a female artist. Let's not hire that motherfucker. Fuck that noise. Oh, this is a female journalist trying to read? Nope. Not let her review our shit. It was never like that. Never. And, and we had a very low um, demographic. We had, like, I think, like 
females and, and our whole concept team was not even one. There was not even a single female artist there. And again, it wasn't like we were like, keep them out. It was just, I mean, look at it right now. Like uh, I, I've been actually complimenting on my class as I get more and more female students because I think that's the solution. The solution isn't to just force people fucking in, right? Yeah. The solution is to just get more people interested in the industry. That's it, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so, so people like Gabby, for instance, is good for the industry because she's going to be good. Uh, she's a good artist and she'll become better and better, but she should be held at the same standard as everyone else, right? No one, I don't think, disagrees with that. Sure. Meaning that she should still be just as good as she needs to be as, you know, Tarek. You know, it shouldn't mm -hmm. matter. Yeah. And I think most people agree with that. And so the problem you see with the tech industry and even in the game industry is not a, a matter of sexism. It's a matter of lack of interest. And we just got to get, just got to get more uh, females interested in it. And I think what happened with the Gamergate that I kind of disapproved of was this, this like broad painted brush to assume that the whole game industry was misogynist. It was like the systematic um, sexism which I just strongly disagree with. I haven't experienced it at all. I, like I said, I only know two people that uh, accounted for it. And even the ones that, um, you know, when, you know, there was the whole hashtag me too movement. You guys yeah. remember that? Which Steve I was actually Harvey. a big, yeah, I was a big fan of that. Um, most of my friends who were female uh, artists and uh, developers for the game industry specifically, their stories were very lighthearted uh, harassment. And I don't, I don't mean that, you know, I don't want to take it lightly. What I'm trying to say is that they were just being hit on or they were just being uh, uh, talked to inappropriately, which is probably going to be unavoidable. Versus like what happened to Olivia Munn, who like walked into a trailer to the director masturbating and coming in front of her. Yeah, that's a little different, you know? And yeah. she, she wrote about it in her book. Nobody took it seriously. She got slandered for it and smeared for it. And then now like people are like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Like that actually happened. And I'm like, are you kidding me, dude? Like, how is this? Like, we got to like, just get them all out. Rat them all out, dude. Rat them all. You know, let's get them out. Let's do like a, a cleansing, dude. Because it, it makes the rest of us who are just trying to just <laughs> say that it's not as bad as you may think for, for some of us, like try to remove that. Let's just get rid of it. Let's start over. Hard reset. And so getting back to kind of the question that was asked about, are there parts of politics? Absolutely. Absolutely there is. And that's probably going to be true no matter where you work right it just depends on how bad it is okay okay so for instance like i said the film industry personally i'm not a big fan of okay that's me personally that's why i stayed away from it mostly and whenever i do work i work from home i don't try to work there okay not because i think they're just a bunch of scumbags i think every single person i run into is like a jerk off like i said i don't think that at all because i know it's a, a broad generalization but I look at the numbers and I look at the stats and I look at my own personal experience and I base it off of that. So working for the game industry specifically, um, like I can assure you that there are probably, you probably cannot avoid some sort of discrimination. I think that's just unavoidable, right? But I can assure you that most game devs are relatively not <laughs> evil. And if they are, if you run into a person that is doing something that is terrible. And this is, this goes for both you guys too. Like what would be a, a, a equivalent that could happen to, because we were talking about the female stuff. That's obvious. The kind of obvious things that can happen to them. Like what, what would be another one that would be obvious? Like they they're treated differently. Like, Oh, well you're a gamer chick. That's a, that's a very discriminatory perception of a female artist or developer. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what would be another one uh, that's obvious? Uh, well, the, just the, the sexual harassment stuff is probably the most common because dudes are just pervs. And then <laughs> we just are, man. And so, so what would be the one for males? Well, in the male position, it would just be the overworking, right? Like having us work more and more hours, having us work on un, ungodly amounts of hours, uh, not listening to under, um, not listening to you because you're inexperienced. Well, this can happen to both male and females, right? But would be exclusive. There's something that I heard that happened to like this dude. He got sexually harassed by one of the female uh, producers at Naughty Dog. So uh, that's just very unlike, uh, not unlikely, uncommon. It just is. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have share the same amount of weight or same amount of uh, um, 
what is it the same amount of trouble but i'm just trying to make a point is that i think like there are politics that people will attack you personally or focus on you specifically and when you encounter this and i'm saying this to all all the people in this in this classroom when you encounter this my solution is just don't put up with it okay and and be very clear if it's if it's there you know there's one thing if you perceive it's actually happening because that can get you in a lot of trouble if you perceive something that's actually not true right so if you believe something is happening then document it somehow find some evidence of it and then come out and like i said rat them out dude get rid of them and i, I always say when you network make friends right i always i've been using that pretty consistently and i use that consistently because you want to work with people that you like okay you don't want to work with people yeah. just because they're an art director and like i said exclusively for females this happens to them a lot right because they'll if they have any semblance of attractiveness the art director uh has that power man and they might use it against them and i've heard i've heard this again and again happened specifically uh in the film industry right mm -hmm. and in the game industry i'm sure it happens still and this type of things in politics you'll see happen and if you're if you're a male artist and you see this happen to your female colleagues uh, i would say say something about it too mm -hmm. right i remember there was a guy who um basically was uh really harassing this girl at an event and we approached him and we're like you gotta like cut it out dude you know it's like if, if we hear that this happens again you bet your ass you're going down you know yeah and so uh i haven't heard anything from that guy again but like if it happens man don't you don't you doubt for a second that he's gonna get murdered socially <laughs> you know and and it's it's really important that, i don't know why when people with great power they just become assholes but it happens man and so so be very cautious of that from all walks of life right people will underappreciate you uh, another thing uh, politics that will happen that happen exclusively against against other males is a jealousy right so if you are really good and better than your colleague um they, they'll they'll throw you under the bus i've seen this happen if okay. you're better yeah better. Oh, yeah okay. this happens like politics man it just happened you might not think that people are assholes but people are assholes dude trust me oh, man. <laughs> yeah and so you just got to be aware of that and you just got to like in the best my best advice about dealing with people like that is just avoid them and try yeah. to get them out of your lives. And if they really wrong you, then let people know, you know, if they truly have wronged you and you have lots of evidence, you should go out of your way to, to do, to, to let them know that this is not okay. Like for instance, I have some artists that I know that most people would admire that think are awesome. And they think they're some of the best in the industry. But if I told you stories of what they did and how, what they did to other artists, uh, most of you guys would not like it at all. You know, you guys would hate that person all of a sudden. But <laughs> but the reality that I came to is that that person's just an asshole. And there's nothing truly illegal about being an asshole. Okay? And there's nothing... It, it, I'll do more harm to the industry if I, like, make it attentive to other people. He never did anything that was sexually harassing or anything like that. It was just like a dick move, what this person did. Okay? It was just it wasn't a very nice thing, and it really kind of screwed up uh, one of my friends. But it wasn't enough for me to think that this person's whole career should be capsized. But if I heard like yeah, someone, uh, if I heard the same artist like sexually harassed or molested or assaulted anybody, uh, and this goes for both sides, then of course I think that's a whole different story. Like it's what happened with the coke again. Like it's Kevin Stacey came out apparently being a pedophile, and he's like yeah, oh yeah, and I'm gay. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> like you're not supposed to apologize and then say that you're gay, like as <laughs> if that's an excuse. Like, no, man, that's. Uh, he was trying know. to use that as like a leverage or something. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about the whole thing, man. But like, think about like uh, Bill Cosby, the Harvey Weinstein stuff. You're starting to hear accusations from other directors and producers. It's just like coming out of the woodworks. Apparently, Woody Allen did some mm -hmm. some shit ben affleck did some yeah shit, they even tried to get ben affleck <laughs> yeah and i'm just kind of like ah oh, dude why it's like a snowball effect just yeah. everybody <laughs> yeah and so that that is true you should be very cautious of that 
my advice usually, like I said, just hang around people you care about and people that you like. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and if you feel like the person's just like, again, if they're just, if they're just an asshole, there's nothing else other than they're just mean to you, then why would you want to like butter up to them just so you can work for that studio? That's true. You know, cause you're going to end up working for them and they're going to be your boss and they're going to make your life a living hell. You're going to hate it. But hey, you know what? I work for this AAA game, you know? So what? No, trust me. That gets old real quick. Working for big games and movies, you'll get over it pretty quickly, you know? Yeah. Especially if you're getting shit on every day. And so, um, yeah, I think it's really important. Uh, wait, what else is there? I think it's more in the middle than either, like good or bad. The internet makes it much worse and people much meaner about it. But yeah, I agree with Gabby. Like, I think that there is some sentiment to the whole Gamergate thing, right? I agree that there might have been some issues that need to be talked about. But I agree, actually, that a lot of both sides were overblown to epic proportions because people get a little too emotionally attached and then they start to push their agenda versus looking at the facts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's hard, man. I admit I don't do this as well as I should either, right? And so that's why I always try to, that's why I kind of backed out immediately because I don't really don't know much about it other than what I saw from working in the game industry. And I saw it as this person was basically saying, it was Anna Carcesian or something like, uh, not, or was it San Sarni? I forget her name, but she's like really. Sarkeesian? Yeah, Sarkeesian. There it is. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of hers, man. Because she, uh, she over exaggerates. And like I said, there might be some real issues when you have people that over exaggerate those issues and they then say, well, see everything. And I'm like, no, man, come on, take it easy. You know? Yeah, I have. I saw the one where she was talking about, I believe it was Hitman, and talking about how she was saying that it was sexist because um, prostitutes were there and how like players can move them around, like whatever. And I'm like, dude, it's just a, it, it, like when I play those games, I don't think, hey, you know what? I'm going to go beat my wife now. <laughs> I think I'm going to go treat women like shit now. In fact, the statistics are the opposite. It shows that more and more young men and gamers specifically are less and less likely to be misogynistic or abusive to women. This is statistically true. So what is she fucking talking about? You know, she over exaggerates. I mean, you should watch them and really consider like, did you ever, whenever you played a game like Grand Theft Auto, yeah. did you ever really feel <laughs> that the game was trying to propagand you and to become a male chauvinistic pig? Uh, and once you think about it that way, you immediately understand, well, oh, no, not really, you know? Mm-hmm. And I understand the narrative that's being spun, but why doesn't she focus on stuff like Cosmopolitan or uh, some women magazines that literally f- say to women, you're not pretty, you're ugly, you'll never get a man, this is how you do it though, right? And it's like, wait a minute, like these are literally art marketed to women and treating them like shit, uh, where games are just marketed to men and they just want to blow stuff up and just blow off, some, uh, blow off steam, you know? And so, yes, I have seen it. And I was not very, I was not a fan. I was just like, yeah, I don't think she's, I don't think she understands her own argument. And so, but that's my opinion. I could be wrong. But I know that for a fact, like I've, I've been working in this industry. Uh, I know most of the, the people that work there, um, there's more and more women that are joining because more and more women are playing games. There just are, right? I believe it's like 50% now women are playing video games. And so there's more, obviously more statistics to favor that why there's going to be more and more women that are going to want to make games. It makes sense to me. You just don't hear about more and more women programming or becoming engineers as much as they would like. And that's why you have like the, the scare, like the, this, this huge separation of like large proportions of men engineers, specifically software engineers versus women. And I think the solution is like, yeah, STEM programs are great. Uh, what else would be good stuff like going to schools? I think one thing that is really interesting is marketing to children. Like when I go to the, the toy store, for instance, and then all the stuff for the girls section are like, like literally there's one I saw, it was like a mop and broom, like a toy. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> I'm not going to buy this for my daughter. Are you kidding me? And then, uh, 
and then like uh and for the boys section it's just like swords and like it's again it's like on the opposite extremes like over masculinity mm. and so i've kind of decided i'll just buy my kids like legos and stuff <laughs> stuff that lets them build and stuff that actually makes them engage creatively uh versus just buying them dolls and action figures uh that's my job is to kind of broaden their their idea and that's kind of where it starts so if my daughter decides to be a fashion designer or or whatever what you would expect um stereotypically that's fine but at least i would have known that she would have been exposed to all these alternatives uh same with my son if my son decides to you know be a concept artist like his dad or something same thing or vice versa if my daughter decides to be concept artist and my son decides to become a fashion designer uh, like who cares all I care about is my, my kids being good at what they do and love what they do. And I think people need to stop focusing on these broader, uh, uh, I'm sorry, they shouldn't stop focusing on it, but they should stop focusing on the narratives that I think that are over-exaggerated and not using facts. They're just look, like, look at this. And then let me explain it to you in a way that sounds legible. And then you just believe it, right? Versus, well, you know, let me prove it with like statistics and facts and studies and research that actually demonstrates my points as well. I think those are the kinds of YouTube videos I've been starting to listen to. I've been doing, uh, listening to a lot of uh, left media too for a long time. So I stopped doing that and started listening to the right to see the counter argument, to see both sides. And I'm starting to understand why people voted for Trump, the imbecile. I really understand now. I really do. Before I didn't, I had no clue. I was like, what? What's going on, dude? Like, why? <laughs> like, he's clearly an idiot. Like, what the, <laughs> like, what's going on here? Have you, you seen his tweets? <laughs> uh, dude, the evidence is there. <laughs> There's no lack of evidence. But I'm starting to understand because people are hurting and people weren't being heard. People are sick and tired of being told that they, they shouldn't be complaining, right? Hmm. And, uh, and I'm starting to understand that. And so I'm like, oh, uh, no wonder people flipped out right so you, you have on one side of the coin people saying you know um uh you have the, the liberal side which i lean more towards you have them saying you know on the extreme levels that donald trump is a racist right and i'm saying no donald trump's an idiot and he just panders to whoever's in the room and it's unfortunately he's surrounded by racists right he's surrounded by people that are like have these agendas and these racist agendas, and he's now rolling racist. That's just now he's rolled, and he just doubles down. He probably wasn't as bad before, but now he's like doubled, tripled down on this because he's an idiot. And then, um, and then like uh, he's not qualified. He's not freaking uh, <laughs> well versed in like uh, culture and society. So he has no idea what he's doing, right? Uh, I was doing a stream last night and someone was like, you know, you should have your son run for president. I was like, he's more qualified than <laughs> our current one. But then you see on the right side, they say that all the liberals are a bunch of snowflakes and crybabies and complain about everything, you know? And that's just not true. The things that like some of the better liberals and progressives are complaining about are, are for human rights and civil rights, right? And these are all noble and justifiable things. And I've found that people who lean more in the center actually look at both of these extremes and say that they're both dumb. And then they're somewhere in the middle. For instance, there are people that understand like the whole social justice warrior thing. They understand the complaint of this. For instance, me and my wife, we watched a video last night of these uh, kids who were just screaming at their uh, professor saying that this exam was racist and that, um, they're under a lot of stress because of all the protests and all the neo-Nazi and white supremacists outside and they just can't take the test. And then like the person in the back was just like, Hey, can you guys like shut up? I'm trying to take my test, <laughs> you know? And then she's like, "Why are you trying to silence us? Like you white kids need to stay, like stay quiet. And I'm like, Oh man, like this is exactly why people are fucking pissed off. You see what I'm saying? Because think about the situation. Like, what would you guys, how would you guys feel if you were in class trying to take a test and a bunch of people came in there protesting the test saying that it was racist, but you know, it's not, it's just a test and they just, they just didn't study, you know, and they're just probably pushing this uh, aggressive agenda. And that's where the right, a lot of the more uh, 
the people that I found on the right that are more actually make some sense, this is kind of their main argument. And this is where I think the snowflakes comments may have came from. But to say something like, well, you know, why should people, why should, you know, people have my tax money to pay for their health care? You know, they, they haven't done anything. Slackers. See, that's going too far uh, on one side of the spectrum. And then I already gave an example of going too far on the left side of the, expre- uh, the spectrum saying that everything is some sort of um, patriarchy, white supremacist agenda. I just don't believe that. Like I'm a black Korean uh, married to a Nicaraguan immigrant. We have cocoa kimchi bean babies. I live in upper middle, I'm an upper middle class uh, civilian in America, right? And I'm doing fine. Never have I felt that I've been oppressed. My wife had some real oppression and even she cut through all the bullshit. You understand? Mm -hmm. And so I'm just kind of like, yeah, maybe there's a point to be heard on both sides. So I think it's really important, guys, whenever you guys are dealing with politics, whether they're outside or inside of work, always try to use facts. Because then that way you won't get too emotional. Like you won't say stuff like all white people are racist. And then get kicked off the <laughs> the cover of what was it like? Um, There's this like lady who just said that, and I'm like, why? Don't you see that that's not entirely accurate? Like James, you're white, right? Did you know you're racist? Because you are. I, I'm sorry to break it to you, man, but you are, dude. And so <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's insanity, man. This isn't, that's not true, dude. It's like going way too far. And so that's kind of how I feel about a lot of these um, uh, progressive minds uh, that go way too far. And I think it's important to stay in the middle. Uh, kind of like what Gabby was getting at, right? Like it's more in the middle, right? It's more likely true. There's some truth to both sides of the argument. It's just finding what's what the real truth is, you know, versus just focusing on what you've heard. And like right now, that's kind of what I was a victim of right now. I was just saying that. And I was like, you know what? I don't really don't know enough about it, about the whole Gamergate thing, other than what I've experienced. And it might not be entirely true. So with that being said, guys, any last questions I'm going to send you guys out into your world <laughs> or any comments you guys want to have? Because I was talking most of the time. If you guys have anything to say. Mm. I got no questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, yeah, it was really uh, informative. Yeah, you, you'd be shocked, man. Like internally, <laughs> people talk about stuff like this all the time. I had a friend who was telling me that he was one of his buddies that he was working with said that if he found out one of his friends uh, was a Trump voter, that he would stop being his friend. And I'm just like, why? <laughs> like, what? Yep. what? What does that mean? I don't understand. Like people voted for Trump, sure. Maybe you don't agree with them. Maybe you hate Trump like I do. I'm not a big fan of the guy. I used to be. I used to love Celebrity Apprentice, but now I can never watch it ever again. Never the same. Um, but like I have friends from Barstow who, who are really conservative, who love Trump, and I'm still friends with all of them. They troll me on a lot of my posts sometimes, but we just talk, we just talk it out and we duke it out. And, um, but never do I think, cause I grew up with these guys. I, I know them. I know they're not evil people. I know they're not racist. I know they're not, this is, this is what probably kind of confused the fuck out of me. That's why, cause I started seeing close friends of mine making comments that I didn't understand, you know? So it made a, uh, my agenda to understand, you know what I mean? Mm. But anyway, seeing as though the class is coming to an end, um, it's really important you guys push your work as best you can for this final weekend, all right? Push it as far as you possibly can because uh, by the time uh, we meet up next week, it will be only one more day. And so uh, the feedback that I'll give you on Wednesday will be kind of the last feedback I can really give you. And so you want to put your best effort so that way any feedback I can give you can push you a little further than where you were able to take your painting. You know what I mean? Um, but before we go, I just thought about something. I mean, Yabby, you're, you're trying to break into this industry, right? Into the film and game industry. 
I'm actually curious because as being the, the only female in the class at the moment, what are your thoughts about all this? If you don't mind, if you don't want to talk about it, you can say, nah, that's all cool. I'm going to go to bed. If you're talking, I can't hear you. Hello? Testing? I'm assuming that's a no, Gabby? Maybe we should check it out. She's like, oh, I'm gonna go get some coffee. <laughs> Hold on, let me type. Can you hear? Oh, okay. <laughs> Whoops, I tabbed. What's up? No, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the stuff that we we're talking about specifically, because you're like the last, or you're the only, <laughs> the last remaining female artist on the planet, because you're like the the only female artist in our class. So I was wondering what your thoughts were, but you don't have to. It's just, a, I'm just asking, it's just a request. And you can unmute if it's easier for you just to talk than to type. Okay. Yeah, in previous classes though, I've been having a, a good, like this is like actually the one that um, we've had a low turnout in female artists. I've had actually like three or four um, consistently for like three or four months. And uh, before I would almost have none or just one or two, uh, but then I started getting three or four. I'm like, I was always commenting on this is the solution. Don't give up, you guys are going to be great. Because uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with diversifying groups at all. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. I had to plug it back in. I unplugged it. Um, <laughs> no, I think, like, it's a really, if anything, kind of awkward subject just because, like, everyone has, like, really strong opinions. Absolutely. About it. And, like, some people will see, like, a random YouTube video that, like, says something and maybe it's not 100% true. And then someone will see the opposite YouTube video that says, like, the complete opposite opinion and it's also not 100% true. So it's, like... It's hard. It's, it's hard, hard to, to um, unpack what people know and what's real and what people don't know and what the emotions have kind of gotten through. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, in, in your experience, have you felt any kind of pushback just because you're a madam? Well, I think like the interesting thing is that it's not always like a super clear pushback, especially if you're not a girl. Um, you kind of get this feeling when you're a girl once in a while that like you're not welcome in the circle. And it's not like someone's there like boo, hiss. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? Dude, not like, that would be terrible. Not like, says, like boys only or something. It's just yeah. you get the feeling that maybe like your experience isn't talked about as much, or yeah. you're kind of looked over for something else, or like you know what I mean. Like I do know. I even see that as an artist, like with with art types. You know, like yeah. That's, I, you know, like, sometimes people default towards more eye candy, but if you're a girl and if you're like a straight girl, it's kind of awkward to do that sometimes. Cause you're like, should I be, should I be doing a little bit more like cheesecake, but like for girls, you know, like it, it <laughs> yeah. brings up a whole bunch of like uncomfortableness. Cause you're like, is that a thing? Should, you know, so that's an interesting point. Subtle stuff that kind of makes you feel like a little bit of an outsider. It's not See, like any so particular person is terrible or something see so that makes sense to me right because what you're talking about because imagine if it's just it is mostly male driven right and and uh and mostly straight men right and so yeah. what you're saying makes perfect sense and actually i think that's probably more likely what it is right it's well, not necessarily like the dude awkward. go ahead i think it's kind of awkward because what ends up happening is that like girls might be really interested in it but mm -hmm. if they feel that kind of outsiderness, they're just going to go and do something that is, is more. Yeah. Fun, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like a chicken egg thing. Like what 
exactly starts it I don't know like is it girls being like well I don't feel as welcome so I'm gonna go into like there's a lot of women in illustration for example like straight up fantasy illustration for like books and all this stuff that's true and you have to kind of wonder is it because it's more maybe accessible open to interpretation is there like a better tone that women feel more comfortable with well, or is most it- illustrators don't have to actually work in-house as well because yeah. I can I can imagine being intimidating by being surrounded by just nothing but dudes who just yeah, talk I mean, about stuff that you just don't relate with. For example, this is a little bit of an awkward conversation because of that. Like in general, like these kind of conversations, at least as a girl, you're kind of like, is this is this going to end kind of <laughs> awkwardly? Like what's going on, you know? Yeah. Well, like this conversation we're having right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You <laughs> shouldn't feel literal conversation. Oh, like, no. The discussion. Like... You're kind of like, you kind of wonder like, is it okay to speak up? Is it okay? Like, because sometimes you don't know, right? Like, some yeah. people are like super fine about opinions, and then you're like, I believe this, and then they're like, So no. see, this is what I don't agree with, right? I don't agree that you shouldn't be able to be uncomfortable and then explain why you're uncomfortable, or even if it's nothing that really. Like, so for instance, like if you were just like, uh, let's um, play out a scenario and I'm just pretending that this is, this is hypothetical where all the dudes in the conversations just started talking about their dicks, right? Which is like a common thing. Okay. okay? It's just a common thing that dudes totally. do. It's and you're just like sitting there yeah. like, this is really uncomfortable, right? Maybe because you just don't want to talk about it. And I, I don't know, maybe you, you'd find with it. I'm just, this is a scenario that I can imagine being true. Right. And then, um, like and if you say something about it like you feel like oh, am i just trying to be like you know a debbie downer like i'm like they're all having a good time it's, it's harmless the things that they're saying but i just don't want to be a part of this conversation right and so like how do you talk about that right and yeah. and then because like especially if you have the perception that it is harmless like you they're just joking around they're not doing anything uh malicious you just just don't want to talk about it just like uh if i'm hanging around um some of my wife's friends and they started talking about things that i'm just not interested in right i think people it's really like awkward for me for it um it's like a strip club analogy basically you have like a lot of oh, yeah. in businesses sometimes do go down depending on the industry at a strip club right and that's kind of a thing it's not a common maybe it's like a little bit more outdated but like in some <laughs> industries and more like yeah probably in the industry. film industry yeah a lot of them would like invite all their friends or like their business, you know, coworkers, whatever. And like, let's go have our meeting at a strip club. So the example is kind of like, as a woman, do you go and feel uncomfortable or do you miss out? And then you miss out on like on business opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's like that kind of thing that I think. Yeah. That's like, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that you should be able to explain that. And I think if you explain that, to sensible people they should re- respond sensibly yeah you understand? and i think there's actually a lot versus of saying discussion, uh, you know like i think there is yeah versus saying oh you don't understand because of your male privilege i don't think that's constructive but if you're saying can i go to a strip club and they're like oh actually that is fair argument okay let's not probably have this meeting there you know yeah. and if you have people there they're just like oh damn dude gabby's ruining it for us then I'd be like, well, you're you're not being sympathetic of the situation of the other person. I think that's completely fair. I was yeah, actually having a come- like a lot of the sorry, um, a lot of the more extreme reactions that people have. It's like people will find the one person on Twitter who says like a super extreme, terrible, horrible thing, and then that'll get shared as like with and the then as the the main opinion of most. Yeah, and yeah, then people can then go like, oh my god, I don't believe that. I, I hate those people now. Like I believe the opposite now and it's not really the case. Yeah. I agree with this. Moderate than you think. Yeah. Well, here, here's, here's my, my take on this. People just need to stop yelling at each other. Right. And uh, they need to listen to one another. Like we're just doing right now. So for instance, I was uh, in a conversation with uh, two lesbians. Right. And we're just talking and we're having a good time. And, um, uh, the conversation ended up like we were talking about like uh, gay clubs and stuff. And they're like, yeah, it's really hard to find like a, an all girls gay club. And I was like, you know what? I've never for one second thought about that as a problem, (laughs) you know, because 
think of it from from our perspective um i'm just assuming you're straight but it, let's say you're you're like let's just assume you are right like a, a straight man and straight woman can just go to the club you know what i mean but when you're gay there is potentially two clubs isn't there because there would be one of all dudes and there'd be one for all girls right and so their problem was that all the gay clubs is primarily men and they're lesbian so they're not into men so it's a problem you know and i was like wow i'm like that's true i don't think i've ever been to a club that had like a, a equal diversity in gay men and women is almost always primarily just men you know because i've been to my fair share of gay clubs and and i uh, after talking to them about that i was like does anyone know about this like is this like you guys should make a store <laughs> you know you guys should do make your own club and they had like a fun name for it too i think it was called gossip was the name for theirs like we were all joking around about it and i was like yeah let's do it we're gonna invest in it it's like I but I that's like a thing in general you know it's like people don't necessarily realize outside of their own experience yeah absolutely what it's like so like maybe sometimes people start a dialogue on it and it sounds kind of uncomfortable or like what no everything's fine but <laughs> you know like, everything's great yeah and it might seem that way but like you don't know if for a long time someone might have been like holding that in or like see so so, so so what you've just told me right now about how just being uncomfortable uh, makes a lot of sense uh, because like I would feel uncomfortable if I was let's say in an environment was only gay men you know what I mean and I don't mean because I'm a homophobe right I mean in the way that I can't associate with them like I could with like my straight friends right and it doesn't mean that I'm like against them and everything that they want to do it's just that we wouldn't have anything in common most likely Right? And you might worry too about like what you say or like if it's more touchy opinion. Or if I say something wrong, they might be offended yeah. exactly. And I don't mean to do that, right? So for instance, uh, when I went to the gay clubs, what made me uncomfortable specifically was when I would go to the bathroom, right? And I remember, I remember thinking in my head, this is exactly what went through my mind. I was like, oh man, this is what it might feel like for the ladies whenever they go just to a regular club. And not even in the bathroom, you know, just like a bunch of dudes just creeping up on you, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh man, that's intense, you know? And it wasn't that I thought all those dudes were like really into me or anything like that. It wasn't like that at all. I just thought, like, for a second, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, like this is a weird scenario because um, all these people that are in this bathroom are all potentially could be attracted towards me you know and i'm in a very vulnerable position right now <laughs> you know and i never thought of it until i went to a, a gay club um into a restroom and i even talked to my friend about that and he was like so like, don't worry you know <laughs> they, they don't nobody just goes around just grabbing dicks and balls and i was like all right good because that's real that'll make me feel uncomfortable but it made me think about what you just said right now i thought about that moment right and so now like I think that's a fair argument. And so I don't know what the solution is other than what I said earlier, which is getting more females interested. About it, you know, like be more aware, like people, if there's a different experience that someone has, like if someone's like, I don't know what it would be like to be, let's say a guy and gay in the game industry. Maybe it's like a whole other thing, you know, that's that, true. Like, yeah. I'm not even aware of that. Like, cause like sometimes I feel like I'm not included in certain games, not in like a, they should change this game for me but like in a i don't enjoy a game because it's a little bit more for guys yeah but then imagine like if i were a gay guy maybe it would be like a completely different tone too maybe there'd yeah. be like jokes that i don't notice now that would bother me a bit you know stuff like that yeah so i think like talking about it is a really good way to you know hearing people out and stuff yeah my uh my uh thoughts about um the whole inclusion in games like having a character that can represent you in a game my 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 thoughts on that is pretty simple um i feel it's a bit more earnest if the company's goal is to create a character that is female or male or gay or transgender or whatever because that serves the purpose of their project right 
versus just including people just because they want to like sit like hit that like well are we diverse enough check you know because i think you don't make uh, good games if you do that right i think you're just pandering uh, a good example of this is like the character um or like what they did with the, the ghostbusters film right where they just completely just ghostbusters but women right versus furioso yeah versus furioso and mad max there's a very stark difference right because in the Ghostbuster example, they just reskinned it, clearly pandering, right? Um, but with uh, the Mad Max, even the, the film is named after a male protagonist, but he really wasn't, was he? You know, uh, he, was, he was almost like a character actor. He was like the secondary actor. We saw his face first, but really who we cared about was Furiosa, right? And she was badass, and she was badass for very good reasons. She had real um, grit believable grit you know um 11 from stranger things is another great example for young girls right again like she she's going through things that only girls would kind of have to go through right like specifically in the situation and i still appreciated it and I, she's one of my favorite characters in the whole show right yeah i think once there's like more characters like maybe more female characters that like are kind of a healthy mix it's easier to like like for example i don't necessarily dislike the witcher even though it's a male lead like i don't connect with it as much yeah because there are a lot of moments where i'm like this is not interesting to me whatsoever <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that's what it should be right it should just be like you either like the game or not you don't but have I would to really look love like a female witcher you know what I mean? Like, that's, I guess, the difference. Like, I don't want them to be like, well, we have to make a female witcher. Well, that didn't they make one with uh, a yeah. Horizon, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was a great game, too. That. Yeah, and it's, and I think it's happening, and I think that's my whole argument, is I don't think the industry is actively as bad as people make it out to be. It's just that there's just more and more of the audience is growing, the female audience, right? So that's how the free market works, right? Like if there's more people who are buying the product, then there's more uh, chances of that product being sold, you know? And so, so for example, like they've always been, um, like Laura Croft was obviously an over-sexualized female character, but the na la latest one, they've toned it down. They made her more realistic. In fact, it's kind of brutal. Have you played it? It's like insanely yeah, brutal. It was, it was really rough, like the... Yeah sort of scenes especially oh yeah man i'm like they really don't want you to lose like you don't want to die and um but like my my point i guess to to support your argument is that i think it should be natural right i think it shouldn't be forced i think people should be aware of it but if you once you start telling people like you you don't put this in because of this i start to think that you're stepping too far but if, if you feel that you need one more of a thing, then you should just go and make it yourself as well. I have um, some friends who are movie directors and writers, and that's their, their, specific, their goal is specifically that, to create more films and projects that are with uh, women in color as the main characters, right? Yeah. And that's their whole goal. It's not to say that they're, they're not trying to say, well, your movies should have um, only female leads or you should start switching out all the characters from Avengers with females. Like they're, they're, that's not their agenda. Their agenda is very simple. It's like, we're just trying to balance the scale by creating original content with female characters as the leads that female audiences can associate with. Right. Like just like how a lot of movies uh, were, or like, especially the video games are made for young boys and teenage boys and, and younger men they're saying we're making this for female audiences right and i say there's nothing wrong with that it's absolutely perfect yeah i think it's about time because like i know that you know i think there have been a lot of female gamers and like fantasy artists or like people who love fantasy like when you think of lord of the rings and stuff i know i think almost all of my friends who are female loved lord of the rings loved you know a lot of these type of things it might not be necessarily like the climate for those kind of games now or like that kind of movie or whatever but like i think there are fans there it's just like maybe they don't feel as not like welcome but like 
they're not as used to it. You know? Like yeah, the, there's definitely going to be people... Animals, like gamers. Yeah, there's definitely going to be people who hate on stuff, right? Irregardless. And there's going to be people who love stuff, irregardless. I guess, um, I guess my my takeaway from all this is that the the industry specifically the film industry the one that was trying to be um highly inclusive right with their their marketing and award shows and what have you happened to do some of the most sexist things that are actually true right like you don't understand like harvey weinstein is like one of the largest film producers in the industry like i even knew who he was when i was trying to pitch movies like i remember me and my friends were like if we can get weinstein to fund our project then we've we've made it and now after hearing like like did you know like they had like a contract that these these women had to sign that said that um if they charge uh him for any kind of sexual assault or harassment that the first charge would be for 250 dollars or two hundred fifty thousand dollars. The second charge five hundred thousand. The third charge seven hundred fifty thousand, and then the fourth charge and every charge after that a million. He would have to pay out to the person who was, so they would shut up. It was like in the contract, as if they knew he was going to do it. You know. To try to help, to try to stop him, you know. And it's like, can you imagine being uh, an actress? Because most of these actresses are attractive too, you know. Like uh, going to a meeting with this guy, and he's just like, it's like that scene you'd see from like those old fifties, like when they make fun of the the film industry. Like, you want to work in show business, eh? Well, you got to do these favors, and it's just like, no, that's real, it's still happening. And so, I feel like uh, whenever we see the real stuff, the real like misogyny, you know, we should handle it aggressively. And then whenever we don't see it. We shouldn't just apply it to things that we don't agree with or have a disdain opinion. For instance, if you don't like The Witcher because it didn't have a female lead, then my answer to that is why don't you create, like why don't some developers create a, a whole project where there's a female lead? Ninja yeah, Theory. It's not to say like they should change The Witcher and add like a woman. You know what I mean? Like that's what I mean. Like I don't. Yeah. That's like my own personal thing with The Witcher. Like when I give that as an example, it's not like me saying anything should be. Changed. And I didn't. I actually don't. I don't want to say I didn't assume that was your case. I was like actually. I was focusing on the people that are like like the the ones that are going real aggressive and trying to find it, you know, and like blaming the game industry. And that's where I have my issues with. I'm like I don't think that's fair, you know. And I think you agree with that. I think you you agree that's not necessarily a good argument. It's like you, yeah, you personally, you wish there was something there, but that doesn't mean that you would want to go over to the guys who made the game and say, you, I don't, I doubt you would be like, you guys are a bunch of misogynistic pigs. I, I highly <laughs> yeah, doubt I that. Think, like, positivity in general, right? Like, yeah. that's the thing. It's like trying to do positive or enact positive change. And it's a bit of a cliche, but it's like, yeah, try to do the positive thing to fix it instead of just being like, everything sucks and you're the worst. and yeah. yeah there's definitely terrible things out there and i think you're, we should focus on them but i i actually follow the same strategy you do which is um try to find the upside and find the solutions instead of just blaming and telling people that they're wrong and evil without any real evidence you know and so that's that to me is uh it really wrecks our industry a little bit because then it makes uh because think about it if this narrative is spin that the the male or the the, the game industry is is very sexist or has these elements in it then it, it like that awkwardness and uncomfortableness that you were just talking about can can be compounded because then you might think that's true right it makes you more afraid to join the industry which is not good not good strat yo and uh, i think it's important that uh there should be more game developers who are female or any walk of life and my my only uh, my only suggestion is that they just make good content because good content sells regardless of where you're coming from. You know what I mean? It just does. Like, do you think that Minecraft wouldn't have sold as well if it was a female developer? Yeah, fucking right. You know? If a female developer developed Minecraft, it would have just done just as well, man. Absolutely. You know? Because it's like a phenomenon. It's an insanity. And so 
and it's happening. Like I said, there's more and more developers who are coming out. They're just, uh, they have female artists and pro programmers and engineers and game designers. It's just a slow burn, man. We can't have it turn overnight. Can't convince a lot of people all of a sudden be a game developer uh, just because they're female. You know, like they just gonna want to, they're, they're going to have to want it, you know, because then that's when they're going to make the best content. And that's how I feel about it. I'm, I, I hope that the industry does slowly but surely switch over to a more uh, diverse like culture that is organic, not forced or pandering, you know. That's why I like um, indie games a lot, like indie game studios and stuff. Like you find a little bit more risk taking because they're like smaller, smaller studios sometimes. Yeah. Like there's really cool ideas. You know what's great about that? You're right. Like what's great about that is that there's going to be more people let, let, let's say like your your suspicions about like feeling uncomfortable is true right then there's gonna be some developers like little girls and teenagers who will make a game on their own right and they'll put it out there and it'll be amazing and then they'll be the bosses of their game and their game company you know yeah. like that's that's very likely to happen in fact that probably will be the thing i'm going to actually make a prediction that that's probably going to happen first you know because I think you're right. I think it's still kind of like if you want to go work for Sony and you're like the only chick there, like it's rough. <laughs> I can imagine, you know? And uh, like I remember when I worked at Sony, there was two uh, men's bathrooms and two women's bathrooms, but they got rid of one of the women's bathrooms because there was just more dudes, you know? They like literally just turned it, they just got rid of the sign and just threw a men's sign in there. And then they just told, because out of like the 100 people there, there was like 11, maybe 12 women employees, like 10% you know and and none of them were necessarily in high positions i think like one or two were like an engineer uh or an animator right i think one was an animator and another one was an engineer but the I rest were in of, um, female animators yeah i was in an animation program there are a lot of women yeah so uh but that was like what 2010 2011 i don't know how it is now I should ask my buddy he works there but I, I, I doubt that it has changed, okay? And again, I worked there and it wasn't like we were actively avoiding it. <laughs> it was just the, like when portfolios come in, it's very limited, that's all, okay? And so you're gonna be the, you're gonna be the change we need, Gabby. I'm gonna put all the weight for the, the movement on you, okay? All right, cool. <laughs> it's all on you, so don't fail me. Do your best on this. Sweat for this homework assignment. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I want to obviously I went over the time, but we've talked about some deep stuff and important stuff, and I think it's important that everyone has some perspective on this. And I appreciate everyone's uh, patience. They're just still chilling out. I'm sure most of you guys are just painting. Uh, and thanks, Gabby, for talking. That actually was pretty uh, illuminating. Thank you. Cool. No uh, and it has just made me realize. I think I've only talked to. Like I said, two other females, and the the time that it happened was because they were they were talking about like these accusations, and I was like, "Damn, dude, that sucks," you know. Mm -hmm. But I never really just sat and said, "Well, what is it? Do you think that yeah, bothers I you?" I think that's actually a, something that I don't yeah. think I do enough. It's a good way to hear, like in like a casual setting, sort of like what really bothers people, not just like what you see online or like what you hear about. Just some more anecdotal evidence. Yeah, I got you. All right, you've just inspired me to actually start doing this. All right, I'm gonna. I have a lot of female female friends, so I'm just gonna just set up time to hang out and talk with them, and see what's up. Get some broader perspectives and start thinking of better solutions. Because my most immediate solution is uh, it's a grounds up approach, like like the way that I'm approaching my daughter. Like I'm, she's playing video games and she plays better than um, uh, her brother, you know, and. So she's going to be a gamer because she, she won't find any, um, she won't feel that it's too challenging for her. You know what I mean? And yeah. like she'll grow up thinking, yeah, games are for everybody. Anybody can play games, you know? And so yeah, I think. I see more of that now, like even with people like a little bit younger than me, but like still adults. There's a lot more like video games are for everyone. There's a game for everyone, which is nice to see. Yeah, she can play Overwatch. She's on it. Yeah, Overwatch is a is a good example. You know, it's really cool. All right, I'm gonna go now. Thanks, guys. 
have a great weekend. Talk to you guys real soon. Thanks again, Gabby, for talking. Appreciate you. And then thanks for all the good questions, everybody. And then uh, we'll talk to you guys real soon. And uh, don't play Witcher 3. I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, talk to you guys later. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.